glad that you could join us today. Um, we've got a couple great speakers uh, lined up for today, Rachel Derby and John Fury. Um, I'm Bayard Stevens. Uh, many of you know me. I hope if you don't, I've uh, been around NCMA about 10 years now, just various uh, committees and groups, and uh, happy to be here today to take care of uh, our government affairs uh, meeting. 2020, what's next? You know, we've had hurricanes. You've had uh, killer hornets. We've had the, this quarantine thing going on. So uh, what's next? That's what uh, Rachel and John are going to uh, bring us up to speed today on. Uh, two incredible speakers, um, two powerhouses on, on the Hill today, um, Rachel Derby and John Fury. A little bit about Rachel before we get going. Uh, Rachel is the Vice President of Legislative Affairs for the Portland Cement Association. She started there in October of 2015. She serves as the Vice President of Government Affairs. She plans uh, PCA's legislative advocacy efforts, uh, working with members to formulate legislative policy and strategy, cultivates working relationships with members of Congress and their staffs. Uh, Rachel also administers PCA's cement pack. Uh, before getting into the cement concrete industry, Rachel worked in the toy industry. I don't know how that ever segued in, Rachel, but it's, uh, it, it's great. Uh, where she served as Senior Director for Federal Government Affairs, and before that, she worked as Director of Government Affairs for the National Association of Police Organization and served on several different staffs uh, for Florida members of Congress. Uh, she's a native of Florida, <clears throat> went to Florida State University, go Knowles, whatever that thing is, uh, and she, served, she currently serves on the Washington, D.C. Advisory uh, Council for the Salvation Army, and she also heads up uh, the North American Concrete Alliance. She's the, the den mother for all of us, and Rachel's going to explain a little bit about that uh, uh, moving forward. And also we have John Fury, who, according to John, he's been on the Hill too long. Uh, he's a partner <laughs> at EFB Advocacy. Uh, boutique lobbying and strategic advocacy burn located near the Eastern Market on the Hill. He's a frequent commentator on political landscape and widely quoted uh, around the country and often seen on uh, such TV shows as CNN's The Situation Room and MSNBC's Hardball, Bloomberg Television, Money and Politics. He's also a columnist for the Hill. Uh, John has worked for, uh, according to him, a too long, but a couple decades on the Hill for, for several different influential members of Congress. Uh, he's a double graduate from Marquette University with a BA and MA in history. Uh, he's got all that plus. plus. He's run three marathons, has two hole in ones, and is, is married to Carrie, uh, married in Ireland, and has two children, Jack and Molly. He's also a host of, of uh, something, uh, the Theory Theory. I know you're going to get into that. So um, in a minute here, I got a couple other boilerplate things to take care of, but uh, first, let me do that, and then I'll turn it over to you, Rachel. Um, I know there's a bunch of you on the line right now. We've been through this. Um, we're, we're on this platform called Adobe Connect. You can listen online, hear recordings, uh, enter questions in the Q&A box. If you wouldn't mind, just tighten something in the Q&A box. Let me know who you are, where you're, where you're from. If you're driving, please don't do that. But if you're sitting at home behind a computer, uh, give a shout out here. It'd be great to hear from you. And we can gauge with, uh, there's a couple interactive uh, components that are going to be coming up. Rachel's got a couple uh, great polling questions coming in. So uh, if you need any help, if, if, if you're not connected right now, you're not seeing this slide. Um, but if you need some help, you can't, you don't have audio problems, whatever it is, get a hold of staff. Uh, give Randy a call, Randy Hertzberg. Uh, her cell phone is 443-996. 0783, give her a call or a text or email Randy at rhertzberg at ncma.org. She'd be happy to help. I'm sure she's probably not had any calls all week, so uh, you're probably feeling a little lonely. This session is being recorded, uh, so we can view it at your new pleasure later. Uh, by participating in a meeting, you are consenting to be recorded. Appropriate behavior. Now, we've been through this many times through all of these meetings. We are working under the NCMA antitrust policy, which was included in your registration process, so we don't have to go through that again. Uh, we're expected uh, to exhibit professional behavior in compliance with the antitrust policy as well as the anti-harassment policy. Uh, you can read the rest of it. Please refrain from, from anything disengaged from appropriate discussions. 
Uh, and just like going to a baseball game, basketball game, or football game, if you see or hear something, say something. Let us know. And we couldn't do this without all of our great sponsors, all of the sponsors that help put this on on a yearly basis. Um, they appreciate you. Know, take a look at it. If you, if you know somebody, you see somebody in the chat, uh, give them a thanks if they're part of any one of these uh, terrific sponsors. Now, we couldn't do these meetings without them. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Derby. Um, I, I met Rachel several years ago with Bob on the Hill. Um, she's just she's just dynamo in what she does. I'm so happy that she's part of the concrete team. Uh, take it away, Rachel. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bayer. Thank you, Bob Thomas. And thank you to the NCMA members who are participating um, in these really important meetings and accommodating a virtual schedule. I know that um, this isn't how everybody planned for the year to go, but we're here and we're making the best of it. Um, we're going to have Jeremy put up a poll um, for folks that are on uh, the line. So if you could go ahead and just take a moment um, before we get started to vote. Um, as you can see, we'll be revealing the results um, as soon as we get it. And the, the purpose of this question is who do you think, not who you're voting for, not who you want to win, but who do you think is actually going to win the White House um, come November? Whether that's November 3rd or a few days afterwards is yet to be seen. Um, so if you're online, please uh, vote. We can't see who you're voting for. Um, it's all anonymous, so thanks so much. And then um, maybe, Jeremy, we could pull the poll a little bit to the side so folks can see the PowerPoint presentation. Um, that'd be great. Wonderful. Okay, so um, as promised, I'm going to talk a little bit about a group that you guys are really active and engaged in. It's called the North American Concrete Alliance, NACA, and it's a coalition of 12 different trade associations. Um, a good bet is if you're saying ACTA, you'll cover at least one of the members. Um, and of course, um, all these 12 groups, our powers combined, we are the industry. And what's so cool about these 12 groups participating in NACA is it allows us to speak as one voice. Um, we have a really powerful statement, and that's really backed up by the men and women that are on this call, um, folks that you don't see every day. So we represent over half a million employees in the United States. So that's kind of a big block, hard to ignore. We represent over $125 billion annually to the U.S. economy. Um, so, you know, PCA might not be that much or NCMA may not be that much, but together um, we have a really important voice. Um, these groups meet every Friday. We have a phone call for at least an hour. Um, sometimes it's, you know, 25 minutes. It's usually to the hour. And um, it's a great group of working professionals that are representing you in Washington, D.C. My favorite part about the job um, you truly, we've gotten the opportunity to truly become friends with these folks. Um, you get to learn about different people, and they're really passionate about the industry. So um, NACA has a lot of meet and greets this year. We had a totally new Congress. A third of the Congress is new, so we had to reestablish ourselves. We hosted um, a transportation and infrastructure uh, meet and greet event with, where we had almost 80% participation from new members on the very powerful T&I committee. Um, we sat down one-on-one -on -one with these members. NACA's uh, collectively worked together to submit testimony, comments, lobbying on meetings, sending letters to the Hill. And we have quarterly meetings. Uh, so far this year, we've only had one in-person meeting. And um, we also report back to your CEO and the other CEOs of these trade associations. So we're vertically kind of on the same page, and then horizontally that information is being carried up. Um, so everybody knows what's going on. If you'd like more information on NACA, we have a very active and beautiful website. It's pretty simple, www.NorthAmericanConcreteAlliance.org. And I wanted to start today talking about the most timely topic, which is COVID, and what has Congress done on COVID. To date, they've passed four relief packages. Well, we, we are getting technical here, and we're saying one is a 3.5 package. Um, so phase one, two happened pretty quickly. Uh, this is lightning speed for Congress. Um, 
we like to say that Congress moves at a glacial pace, but not in response to a global epidemic. Um, you can see this is a lot of money going out really, really quickly. This was a deal that was not uh, brokered by every single rank and file member. This is a leadership play, um, and the White House was really, really engaged on these issues. If it weren't for Mnuchin, I don't think we would have had a deal. We've been on, we'd be playing deal or no deal uh, for quite some time with those brief cases. But um, again, the money that's going out here, um, it's hard to make sure that's accountable. Um, it's also really tough for Republicans to swallow that big pill, um, and that's why we haven't gotten to phase four just yet. Um, I've noted that Congress, the House side has passed a bill, the HEROES package, it's a spending bill, um, and the Republicans just aren't quite comfortable with that. And there's a lot of hang-ups about, you know, one thing would be unemployment benefits. Right now they're at a record $600 a week, um, which certainly was needed at the beginning of the pandemic, but it's almost served as a disincentive. Even looking through your industry survey, it seems like that is a disincentive in impacting um, this industry specifically. Um, I also, I think I skipped the slide. Yeah. So I also wanted to touch on some economic lessons. Um, basically, there's a lot of concrete that is needed to repair infrastructure. Um, it seems to be one of those activities that has continued to occur, but if you look behind the curtain, the industry has certainly been impacted. Um, initially, you can see that we were projecting a 20% decrease in Q2. Um, it actually looks like it's going to be more of a um, 1.3 decrease for Q2. But overall for the year, I think folks are going to continue to see a lower amount. Um, this is going to disproportionately impact PPE equipment. So how do you have a safe work environment? How are you accessing this equipment in times when other people are looking for the same thing? So I'm going to get a little bit more into grassroots. Um, one of the beauties about NACA is, is you can reach out. We can speak as one voice. We can reach out. We have an active campaign going right now asking you to urge Congress to provide additional funding for the construction industry um, and invest in infrastructure. We have this, this new package that's being negotiated. We're still in this kind of recovery mode. We're not yet in a stimulus environment, um, but when we get to a stimulating environment, we want to make sure that our industry specifically is getting the funds um, that they need, particularly as state DOTs are seeing a rapid decline in revenue. Um, from gas taxes, from lack of people traveling, and that really falls on state budgets, which are already having other shortfalls. So this is a pre-written letter. You can contact your member of Congress and get engaged. Um, I also want to give a shout out to you guys. Um, I know you've been working with the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, it's critical. These are easy processes. It's the number one way that you can make sure that people who are representing you in Washington are representing your values and your concerns. So um, it's super easy. You just type your name, your zip code, and the work's already done for you. And of course, if you want to add a little extra statement in there for flavor, you're welcome to do that. So let's talk about infrastructure. People ask me all the time, Rachel, what is happening in Washington? Donald Trump promised us a trillion dollar infrastructure package. And he certainly brought more attention to the issue than we've seen from previous presidential candidates or even presidents. Um, he understands what it's like to be a builder. He views himself as a builder. So in the U.S. Senate about a year ago, uh, we had a reauthorization package called the ATIA. And um, this package, is, it's really great for our industry. It reauthorizes um, expiring programs for another five years. It actually gives us a 27% increase. So it's, it's good. Um, this was a bipartisan package. It went through committee markup and now it's waiting other committees to contribute to it. So not to be too technical, but the banking committee is going to say, how do we pay for this? We can't just continue to print money and spend it. We have to find a way to pay for these kinds of packages. Um, so that is the big question, is how do you pay for a reauthorization package? And we meet kind of these new infrastructure needs. The House, on the other hand, or on the other side of the aisle, is moving forward with the Invest in America Act. It has about $494 billion for highway and transit. 
Um, this is a huge package that was included in what you see on the slide, the, the Moving Forward Act HR2. Um, so basically, this is the Democrats infrastructure package. It is a partisan package. Typically, this is a topic that both Republicans and Democrats can engage on, and that just hasn't been the case um, that we've seen so far. So um, that's kind of a big picture. I also want to point out a few other things. The White House has their own reauthorization package, and it's going to be for 10 years. And guess what? It's that magic $1 trillion number. Um, so it's a little bit broader than just your traditional um, factors. So to sum it up, we've got a Senate package that's so just regular reauthorization. It's bipartisan, but we don't know how to pay for it. We've got a House package that was incredibly partisan, and it, it is an infrastructure package. It gives money to schools. It gives money to broadband. It's kind of everything under the sun that can relate to infrastructure. Um, but there's no way to pay for it uh, at all, and it's just spending. And then third, we've got a package that's yet to be revealed from the White House, but because you've got good lobbyists in Washington, they already know what's in it um, and when to kind of anticipate that. And that is kind of a reauthorization package. But like I said, it's a little broader. So, of course, the White House can manipulate that. So that's where we are with infrastructure. Um, likely what we'll see is we'll come back in September. They'll try to um, pass a bill to fund the federal government appropriations. They won't be able to do that in time by the deadline at the end of September. So they'll pass what we call a continuing resolution. This CR will likely have an extension for Fast Act Authority. So it's not giving you more money, and it's not giving you any certainty about what's happening in Washington. I also want to briefly touch base on a few other legislative items. Um, and a big one that I've been spending a lot of my time on, and NACA has also been verging, is climate change. Um, this is going to be huge for our industry. This is what's going to dominate the next 10 years for your businesses and your bottom line. Uh, we have a draft bill that came out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and then we also have a newly created select committee on the climate crisis, um, and they also just came out with a big report. Um, I could get into a lot of items here, and I do want to touch on the important things, but be sensitive to our time block today. So if you want to reach out to me via email, phone call, let me know, and I'm happy to talk to you about it. But what you need to know that's related to concrete in these packages is it talks a lot about life cycle analysis. Um, these are the building materials. For buildings, um, environmental declarations are important and how those are formed, how you're taking a competitive advantage for concrete over wood or other substitute building materials. Um, this is a real opportunity for us as an industry to talk about the importance of resiliency and our resilient nature. This is a positive. This is something that we can get into legislative language, that we can reinforce the message when we're talking about natural disasters. Um, and it's something that is a buzzword when we talk about climate change. We want to make sure that we're leveling the playing field for materials. We want to make sure that we're getting credit for carbonization. Concrete is actually sucking CO2 out of the air. That's important. How are we... How are we monetizing that? How are we able to get credit for that as an industry? So as I mentioned beforehand, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, there's a lot of behind the scenes work going with these reports um, and draft legislation that's going to dictate what's going to happen in the future, especially after November. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating in today's session. We're really excited. Um, and I'm very pleased to turn it over to my good friend, John Ferry. Um, John and I have worked together almost my entire time over the past 13 years in Washington. Um, he's somebody that's guided me. I look up to him, and he is, if you want to cut through the noise in Washington, you should read his articles. You can check out his podcast. Um, so John's going to give us a brief summary, and then we're going to kind of enter into something new because I'm sure you're getting death by PowerPoint, and we're going to engage in a really riveting conversation, and we also invite you to participate in that as well. So I'm going to turn it over to John to hear what's next. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. And Rachel, you are simply the best. Bayard, thank you for uh, helping uh, with the moderation and being part of this. And Bob, thank you for everything that you do. Um, let me just go quickly through my slideshow. I'm not really a slideshow person, but I thought that would be something that would be uh, fun to talk about. What is next? And I think, you know, one of the things that we all try to ask ourselves is, can we believe the polls? And, uh, you know, I remember how well President Michael Dukakis and President uh, Fritz Mondale did, and uh, of course President Hillary Clinton. No, you can't believe the polls, especially right now. 
don't believe national polls. They, they're they meant to uh, drive a media narrative. Uh, national polls don't matter because if we have an electoral college. I don't believe any media polls because they are there to capture headlines. I don't believe any polls that are done with only registered voters or adults. You'll see a lot of polls like that. That is kind of, um, you know, done to kind of create a certain, you know, storyline that the reporters want. Um, you know, I saw it, and this is going to be kind of ironic, I saw a poll the other day that said fully 65% of the American people are not comfortable expressing their political views uh, in public. Uh, and I think that that, you know, tells you a lot of where a lot of these, uh, especially Trump voters are, they're afraid to tell pollsters who they are, they're going to vote for, although I've been watching uh, the, the, our poll here today, and I think it'll be really interesting to see how it turns out. So I'm a very suspicious of polls in um, the uh, in the Trump era, and I think that we you know, all need, need to be very careful. So bottom line, don't believe the polls as they are right now. We've got plenty of time for this election. I think that we, um, we don't know how the next uh, three weeks are going to play out, so let alone the next six months. Um, and so I, I, I just let you know that this, this race is not over yet. And even then when I look at the polls, I see that you know, uh, President Trump has had some of the worst uh, luck or, or worst performance or uh, you know, all the stuff with COVID, and he still is very close in all the battleground states. So don't believe the polls. And I would I would say that that's one of my my, my uh, admonitions to you. Um, so I think about this election in in two ways. It's you know our demographics destiny. I, and I I look at it the the two different uh, ways of um, the two different kind of narratives going on right here within uh, the, the country. You have I see a contest between blue collar America and what I call the melting pot. Blue collar America is Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan. These are the states that President Trump definitely has to win. Uh, I put Minnesota on there because I see what's going on in Minneapolis. And I think that, that uh, last, in the last election, Trump really had a real chance to win Minnesota and got a lot closer than people think. If you look at these, the demographics of these states, are, they're overwhelmingly uh, white voters, a lot of blue collar voters. And, you know, for, for Trump, if he wins, he's got to win almost all of these states. With and if he wins Minnesota, that's that's kind of some icing on the cake. Um, it's at versus the melting pot voters. Um, and now I here we are. The, the the melting pot I think of Florida, uh, Georgia, Texas, uh, Arizona, Nevada. All of these uh, the demographics in these states are very very interesting. And if, I put Georgia on there and Texas because. The Biden campaign believes that they have a real chance of winning in Texas. They're actually putting a lot of field workers down there. I, I'm a little bit skeptical, but if they look at the demographics, it really does show that they've got a shot. I mean, uh, Texas right now is a minor, almost a majority minority uh, place. Georgia the same way. Florida, as, as Rachel knows, very diverse. And so uh, I look at this. Uh, Trump usually has to win all of these states except for Nevada. Uh, I am uh, really worried about both uh, all, you know, Texas, Georgia, and Florida, and we'll see how this goes. You know, I think that the president has to get a message that works out uh, better than what he's got right now. So what's going to drive people in this election? Well, I think that the two major factors are in any election are fear and anger, fear of what the other guy is going to do and anger at the current situation. Um, you know, people are obviously very afraid of um, – uh, what will what could possibly happen if in a Biden administration, especially uh, Trump voters, and people uh, are really angry at what the president has done, and, and I think that these are the two big motivations for both sides. Uh, there's been you know, I put a, a Warren G. Harding uh, on there. Warren G. Harding is a uh, was the president. Uh, he won the election in 1920. The last time we had a pandemic, actually, uh, and he rec he uh, promised to return to normalcy. Uh, and I do think that there is, that's, a, that's a kind of subcontext. People want to get to normal. Will we ever get to normal? We have a new normal. And I think that that is a subcontext. The, the idea of Joe Biden being the next president, people want us just a sense of uh, can we get, get done with all this, you know, turmoil, constant turmoil. And they, th they think of Joe Biden as, you know, like an old shoe. Um, but, you know, the, the, the question is, uh, is that going to be enough? And I'm, I'm most fascinated by uh, president Trump because he is an outsider. He's running as an outsider, and he's been president for four years. I mean, he's someone who's running 
against the political establishment despite being part of the political establishment because if you're president for four years, by definition, you're part of the political establishment. So this return to normalcy is, is a subcontext for both the candidates. It's the economy stupid, or it's the economic stupid, but for um, the president, President Trump does better when he talks about the economy. He polls better when he talks about the economy. And if we can get through the COVID, it is something that uh, the COVID crisis and turn the focus back on the economy. I think the president does have a a very good chance of of doing well and, and again with a lot of the voters. And now that we go back to the whole idea of change versus the same, the status quo. The fascinating thing about President Trump is even if he's president, he still we don't know what the status quo is going to be. And but President, you know, Vice President Biden is a protector of of the, of the status quo. He's someone who represents the old political establishment. So that's the one thing I'm also trying to figure out. Is this a change election or is this a, is this the same type? Do we want the same incumbency? And it's a very complicated question because President Trump is still a change agent and the, 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 the challenger is, an, is a, someone who's really kind of wants to go back to the old ways. Um, so what are the issues that are driving uh, this election? Well, I think the number one issue is uh, that little green guy over there. That's, that's, that's the symbol for COVID-19. If the president, if we cannot get past uh, this COVID crisis, uh, President Trump is going to lose. Um, I think a, a secondary issue out there is is obviously a school. Can we get the kids back to school? This is this is very personal for me because I want my darn kids to go back to school. And um, it's it's something that I think that if the president plays it right, he can real really a, appeal to suburban uh, working mothers who he's really done very poorly with. And ever since he won the election, and if if he can get back on a, a good message on that he wants the kids to go back to school safely, and the Democrats and the teachers unions are against them, um, I think that that could work for him. Now we have uh, all these riots in, in different parts of uh, America, along with all the protests. So it's a law and order versus social justice um, uh, uh, fight. And you know, I think that the the left has gone pretty far in the social justice. You see it with a lot of corporate America. Uh, you, have, you have BLM uh, kind of all over the place on, on the NBA, uh, uh, MLB. Um, you know, and they, they make a good point. Obviously, they, they, they want uh, social justice, and I, th I understand that. But when there's riots in the streets, it, it has an impact on, on voters. And I think that um, right now, uh, when the more, the more crime goes up, the more the president promises law and order, I think the, the stronger position he's going to be in. I think you, you talk about immigration. Uh, that is something that's going to drive both sides, the base of both sides. President, you know, has made um, one of his campaign promises was to build the Great Wall. And um, I think that that's something that he uh, is, is going to continue to promise on. And he also has become an immigration restrictionist. And, you know, that, that has an impact on, 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 the, um, uh, on the economy. Uh, but it also uh, it has an appeal with the blue-collar voters that he's trying to get to. And then to, to Rachel's earlier point, um, the Green New Deal. Uh, this is something that is not necessarily a top-tier issue with most voters, but with the liberal left uh, and the ones who fund a lot of the campaigns, this is the number one issue for them. So this is something, the Green New Deal, uh, uh, the environment, is something that doesn't necessarily poll high, but it is something that motivates a lot of uh, Democrats and their and their wealthy donors. And then finally, we don't know. This is a big wild card. But will we have a Supreme Court, court justice uh, opening before the the election? And I think that this is what is driving a lot of the Washington parlor games. Uh, I I think if I think that if it's something that uh, if, if Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, decides to retire or something else happens, um, you know, this is something that could throw another wrench in the election. I think it's something that will, this could drive. Uh, voters on both sides of the polls. Um, the race for the Senate. I, I want to just mention these these folks. Uh, we have, you know, Republicans have some uh, really tough races. Uh, you got Tom Tillis, who consistently polls uh, 10 points below his opponent, Joe Cunningham. Uh, you got Cory Gardner, who's in some serious trouble. You got Martha McSally. Uh, Steve Daines is pulling closer now with Bullock. Uh, and then Susan Collins has some real issues. Uh, I think that uh, with uh, Doug Jones, that's a kind of a given uh, for Republicans. Uh, I, I will put Gary Peters on, in Michigan. He's got he's a Democrat, and I think that John uh, James has a really good chance of, of beating him. And then Tina Smith in Minnesota. I just throw that out there. It's a it's a it's a long shot, 
Uh, this is a long way of saying that if things go badly for Republicans, they can go very badly and they can lose the Senate. Um, and in, in, uh, in, uh, but if they get a couple of these seats, uh, they will be able to keep the Senate. And so I think that that's uh, something that I, I'm keeping a, a slow, an eye on. Race of the House. Uh, there's about 30 seats that uh, Republicans need to win to take back the House. Uh, my discussions with the uh, NRCC is that they, you know, they feel good about uh, the battleground states. They feel good about their their their, their campaigns. They've got some good candidates. Um, that uh, that being said, there's 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 about 28 seats. I can't I don't know off the top of my head uh, that were in Trump districts. Uh, we have a few seats in uh, one that Republicans kept. Uh, uh, that were won by Hillary Clinton. Uh, I, I believe that uh, Republicans, if Trump wins big, they've got a real shot at winning the, the, the House back. Uh, if Trump is, is close, I think you can still see Nancy Pelosi as your speaker. Um, so the Biden agenda, you know, uh, the great thing about Joe Biden and his agenda is he's been actually fairly specific of what he wants to do. And uh, it's, I, I put Walter Mondale up there before because Walter Mondale was the last president uh, can, can, can campaign for president, presidential candidate, who promised directly that he was going to raise your taxes. Um, and Joe Biden has said it over and over again, I'm going to raise taxes. And I think that, you know, if you want your ta taxes raised, you know, go vote for Joe Biden, go for it. Um, not a lot of people want to do that. But he, he's going to be someone who's going to raise your taxes. He wants to increase the minimum wage. He wants uh, very aggressive plans on free education, for especially for college. Uh, he wants to strengthen Obamacare with a public option. Uh, he is a big fan of the New Green Deal and wants to tear down uh, President Trump's wall. And he's got a very aggressive uh, housing policy that uh, he's, he's going to be pushing for. Um, now, President Trump on his second term, hmm. well, he's been asked several times what he wants to do in his second term. And he's not really given a very good answer. I think Sean Hannity's asked him several times, well, what do you want to do? And I think he, what's he want, what he says is he wants to make America great again, you know, something like that. But obviously he wants to finish building his wall. Uh, he wants to continue his, you know, tough talk with China. Uh, you know, we're getting as, cold, as close to a Cold War with China as we ever have. You know, what President Trump is really is a jobs president. And the other thing that I think from, from, from the perspective of, of what you're, you're going for as far as infrastructure, he's somebody who desperately wants to continue energy independence and have pro – pro-growth energy policies in place. And then finally, his big campaign thing is make America great again. Um, so the rest of the year, uh, I wanted to put um, uh, Charlie Brown and Lucy there because, you know, Rachel was talking about infrastructure. Inf infrastructure reminds me, you know, of, uh, of Lucy saying to Charlie Brown, let's go kick a football because every three months people talk, this is going to be infrastructure week. We're going to do infrastructure. We want to do infrastructure. And it never happens. I think it's a great talking point, but before, because, uh, Senator McConnell has been a little bit nervous about uh, spending all that money, and because I think Nancy Pelosi would rather have an issue than and then actually give President Trump a a uh, campaign uh, a campaign win, uh, that you're not going to see any major accomplishments outside uh, of um, the, the Care Force package, which I think everyone needs to get done, and everyone understands that we need to uh, kind of gird all the local and state communities and help small businesses with a, a, a new uh, a COVID-4, whatever you want to call it. So we have uh, Lucy taking the football away from Charlie Brown. Then we have the elections, which, you know, who knows how long that's going to last. And then to Rachel's point, we're going to have a, a lame duck. And I think the lame duck is going to be very, very lame. They're, they're, they're usually um, not that much fun. I, when I worked in leadership, I found would be lame ducks the worst part of the year because no one really wanted to be there. But I think that to Rachel's point, they're going to have to f figure out how do we get all of our uh, spending bills done and get it done as quickly as possible? And so with that, um, I just want to say I really uh, enjoyed uh, this, this conversation on, on, on the Internet webs. And, Rachel, looking forward to your questions. Awesome. Thanks, John. So, um, Jeremy, if you don't mind, we're going to put up another poll question for folks. Thank you for participating in the first poll question. And, um, this question is, is, who are you going to be voting for in the election? Um, so it's different than who you think is going to win. It's who you're casting your ballot for. And I think what's so great about this kind of question is uh, you can see the contrast after we reveal the results. Um, quite surprised by the first, uh, first polling so far. So um, John covered a lot of great points in here, and you really did a nice 
a nice job at kind of laying out for us, the audience, um, you know, what a Biden presidency might look like. Um, you know, you said we can expect that taxes will go up, um, but what do you think will be Biden's first 100 days? Like, what's the first thing he's kind of going to be doing? Aside from the regular, we're going to set up the cabinet, we're going to get my people in place. You know, what does the first 100 days look like just for Joe Biden? Well, I think the first thing that Joe Biden is going to uh, have to confront is this push by uh, many of his colleagues to get rid of the filibuster rule. Uh, you know, the, for what's, what's the 10 decades. What's that? What's, the filibuster what's the rule is, so a filibuster is the ability for uh, uh, under, you, you have to get more than 60 votes to pass legislation in the Senate. Uh, and it's become, because we live in such a partisan era, it becomes, uh, it's become very, very difficult to get more than 60 votes to proceed to legislation. And I think that there's been a, a lot of effort by the left that they want to say that if, if they get the majority, uh, if they get, you know, 52, 53, 54 votes, they want to be able to govern with Joe Biden and they want to be able to pass legislation outside of budget reg legislation and only have to pass it through with, by more than uh, one more than a majority. 51, 52. That will completely change the nature of the Senate as an institution, making it much more like the House. It will also make the voters much more accountable, uh, or the, the senators much more accountable to the voters. Um, I think this is going to be a fascinating discussion, a fascinating debate. Joe Biden, being a former senator, you know, he has great appreciation for the rules of the Senate, uh, and he's going to have a lot of pressure on him to go with the left, get rid of the filibuster, and he's going to want to do that. Uh, because he's going to want to get his legislative program done. Now, what will that legislative program involve? Well, I, I honestly believe that the number one thing that he's going to have to do is get a budget. And how he gets a budget is he's going to, he's going to want to increase uh, taxes, and then with that he's going to also want to increase spending. And how is he going to want to increase spending? I think, you know, to get to your point, I think he's going to want to do infrastructure. Uh, I think that's one of the things, one of his top things, and I think he's also going to want to do a bunch of also – uh, uh, his agenda, you know, whether it is uh, raising the minimum wage, he's, he's going to want to do that, substantially raise the minimum wage, but to $15 an hour uh, at, the, at the federal level. He's going to want to, uh, as much as he can, do a clean energy package, because that's something he's promised. Uh, he's going to want to do a housing reform, uh, and then he's going to want to uh, pass uh, uh, legislation on immigration. So I think that the first 100 days, um, you know, this is not Biden's first rodeo. He's been around Washington for a long time. Uh, and I think that he's going to try to pick his shots carefully. Uh, but I think the number one thing he's going to want to do is get rid of the filibuster rule and then uh, pass a budget. Great. Okay. Very helpful. And, you know, we also touched on this, and this is an issue that's budding for our industry. It seems like Biden is kind of everyone's yes man. He, he tells people what they want to hear. You want to progress the Green New Deal? Sure. You want to make sure kids don't have to pay for their loans? Sure. The answer is yes. And typically we see presidential candidates get, like, more moderate pulled into the center. But we've seen kind of the opposite go here. We're having Biden pulled from his centrist ways. Um, so how do the progressives, um, especially the Dunn caucus, impact what Biden is going to be doing, even with things like we, we talked about the climate agenda? Do you really think, you know, when he's president, like this is going to be something that's going to continue to pull him and impact his ability to get the job done? Or he can kind of rely on those old relationship skills and knowledge of how Washington works? Well, you know, it's going to be really, really interesting, Rachel, because a, uh, a president proposes and the, the Congress disposes. And what is most interesting is if Joe Biden wins, uh, I, I think he will usher in a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House. And um, the fact is, is the Democrats in the Congress are much more liberal um, than, than Joe Biden. And they're going to they're going to push him legislatively, and then he's going to be put in a position, whether he likes it or not, he's going to have to sign legislation that they're going to come up with. And so if you think about Nancy Pelosi, you think about Chuck Schumer, you think about uh, uh, the, the, the Senate and, and the House, they, they have steadily moved further and further to the left, 
And I think that they are going to pass legislation, and I think Biden is going to have to ride, ride the storm out. And I think that he's got some centrist ways, but as you pointed out during, during the campaign, he's making an awful lot of promises that he's going to have to try to keep. And he's not going to make, he's not going to, uh, you know, turn, turn to his Democratic progressive constituencies and say, you know what, I know I, I, I said I was going to do this, and I, but I'm going to veto this legislation because it's, it's just too far to the left. He's not going to do that. He's going to sign any piece of legislation that, that passes the Congress that comes from a Democratic Congress that is, by and large, much more left than many of their voters. So, um, you know, I don't think that Biden can govern as a centrist. You know, one of the things that we, the mystery of this election is just, it really wrapped up quickly for the Dems. We had a lot of candidates out of the gate. And there is still one big mystery, I think, for everyone, no matter what party you're in. Um, and typically, this just doesn't matter. It's a nothing burger. But this election, these circumstances, we're, we're dealing with gentlemen that are pretty advanced to be presidential candidates. Why does the VP pick matter more in this election? And who do you think well, it's going to be? Know, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, Joe Biden has run probably the first campaign ever from his, from a, his basement. There's been nobody who has been less you know, willing to actually engage with the voters than, than Joe Biden. And I think it's a very smart strategy on his part because, you know, he's letting Donald Trump make all the mistakes. He's letting Trump kind of do whatever Trump's going to do. And he, you know, doesn't have to really do anything because Trump is kind of, it seems to me, kind of doing a good job of slitting his own throat. Um, you know, I think that at some point in time, you know, he's got to show that he's got the vitality and the mental acuity to run the country. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions of whether he, he has that. And when you hide in the basement, you, you know, you hide from that kind of public kind of uh, inspection of what you can do. You know, you've already had people um, from, the, from uh, the media who are his friends and allies say that we shouldn't have a debate. We don't need debates. And, well, you know, debates are, uh, you know, one of the best ways for the, the voters to see whether they, the, the person they're going to vote for can kind of withstand the scrutiny and take the, take the heat. And, you know, Biden is now saying maybe I don't want to do any debate. So I think that would be a catastrophic mistake in his part. So that means that the vice presidential pick is more important than ever. Um, and, if, you know, you have a, he's going to be the oldest president in history. Uh, he's somebody who is basically run by hiding in the basement. And, you know, he's, there's a lot of concern that he's got the ability to, to fully function as, as, as in the White House. Um, so who he picks, the other thing that's really important is Biden has said he's not going to run again. So whoever he picks is going to be, uh, you know, automatically the front runner to run uh, in his place. So that's, that's, there's, there's the, the mental ability for the president, the, President Biden, to do his job, and then you know the fact that he's going to be replacing someone. Now, he, what he has done is he's taken half the country, uh, half the Democrats, and said, you know, I'm not going to consider you because you're you're a man. <laughs> so uh, so he's already kind of said he's going to, no matter what, he's going to pick a woman which is fine. I think it makes sense to, to do that. You, you want to make history. Uh, I remember, you know, when um, you know, Walter Mondale made history with Geraldine Ferraro. That, would, that worked out really well for him. Um, you know, I think that he has got to make sure whoever he picks has the ability to do the job and take it from job one. It used to be that you would pick a vice presidential candidate because of regional balance uh, or because they would get you a state or because they, they temperamentally were able to, um, you know, fill a, a void that you didn't have. I mean, if you think of George W. Bush, he picked Dick Cheney because Cheney had so much, you know, experience in, in national security. Uh, and it gave people some sort of presence of mind that some security that, you know, this would be taken care of. Um, so to, the, this is a long way to answer your question. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you picked Susan Rice, um, who was close to the Obamas, uh, very, very talented woman, very, um, very sharp, um, and not, not necessarily seen as, as far left as someone like a Karen Bass, who uh, has been mentioned a lot. She's a House member, uh, had, you know, some, some experience uh, uh, with uh, Scientology and with um, uh, Fidel Castro. Uh, and then there, a lot of people have been talking about Kamala Harris. Um, Harris, we have this, the, the California senator, is someone who really kind of did a good job of skewering Biden during the debates and almost knocked him out. Um, and there's a lot of bad blood there between the Biden camp and the Harris camp. Um, 
If I were my if I were a betting man, I though I would pick I would think he's gonna pick Susan Rice. All right, you heard it here first. Susan Rice, Google her right now if you don't know who she is. Um, in the news, the Republicans have been having what we would call a Trump issue. Um, how do you walk the line with a president that's out there and says, you know, we support Confederate monuments, um, you name it, he's saying it, not going with scripts, um, insisting on injecting Lysol to solve the COVID problems. And, you know, it's okay to spend. You know, he's not a traditional Republican in the sense that um, he's fiscally conservative. He's spend money, spend money. So how is this going to impact the election? You talked about the Senate. And I, I think for context for folks that are participating in this, right now we've got a Dem House and a Republican Senate. And it's likely to continue to be that Dem House. So the, the Senate really is the backstop, particularly if, if you see the presidential go to the Democrats. So they're going to be the one thing holding our country together. And there's just a, it's a slim margin. And those are really tricky, tricky, tricky states. And so that's why this question is so important, I think, for us in Washington, those outside the Beltway, um, why, why it is important for one of those chambers to be held. Um, how do the Republicans kind of walk that line with him? Well, listen, I think that, first of all, keep in mind, it's not about President Trump. It's about President Trump's supporters, the Trump voter. They make up the vast majority of the Republican base. And if you try to walk away from the president, you're walking away from the Trump voter. You don't have to engage. I think that a lot of senators feel like they have to engage and comment on everything that President Trump says or does. They don't have to do that. They don't have to play pundit. They have to keep to their own game. But they have to be supportive of the White House. They have to be seen as being supportive of the president and what the president is trying to do in, and, and find ways to agree with the president. And when, when you disagree with them, you know, try to keep it on the down low. Um, yeah, I, I've been a, around the country a lot and I've been watching a lot of campaign ads and every Republican ad I've seen, they are trying to get as close to President Trump as possible. They, the, the House, especially in the House voters, they understand how, how popular President Trump is with the Republican base. And they, I want to be close to them, not far away from them. I, I remember, you know, when I worked uh, in the House Republican leadership in 1992, uh, and Ed Rollins was the head of the National Republican Congressional Committee, and he was urging candidates to run away from President Bush, H.W., George H.W. Bush. This is not that kind of election. People, candidates are not running away from President Trump. They're running towards him, especially if they're running in House races. And, you know, I think that you, what you need to do if you're a Republican, is, especially a Republican senator, uh, and you've been in office and you're an incumbent, you need to let people know that what your record is, you need to know what you want to do, and you have to kind of cut your own identity. If you've been in the Senate for six years and you're still kind of largely identified as uh, someone you know, with President Trump, you're not doing it right. You, you sure you're a United States senator. You have to cut your own identity, and you have to make sure that people know who you are and what you want to do, and that's, that's how you kind of walk that line. Okay, so that's a great segue here. What I want to do is just give us a breather, um, and I want to release the results. So the first thing I want to do is who do you think is going to win the election? Jeremy, can we go ahead and publish those results for folks to see? And I was personally really surprised by this. Um, we'll get those results here. Uh, you can see, uh, well, this is who you will vote for, um, but that's okay. So who you will vote for... Uh, Okay, here we go. Who do you think is going to win win the White House? This is really close. Um, you know, John, my thoughts on this were like, wow. I, I for sure thought most of the country was thinking that Biden, he's got it locked in the bag. Um, you know, I'm living in this kind of beltway bubble where if people here think kind of Biden has it locked in the bag. You know, he's been hiding in his basement. Trump's the one that's destroying himself. But I was... I was truly shocked that folks outside the Beltway kind of think this is more neck and neck than it is. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I have what I call my, uh, when I live, I live in, on Capitol Hill, I live inside the Beltway, and I have a, a taxi driver test. And I typically ask my taxi drivers, uh, who, you, who do you think is going to win? And if you ask most taxi drivers in D.C. who's going to win, they'll tell you Donald Trump's going to win. Um, you know, we live in a bubble in D.C., and we, uh, we all believe, you know, it's, it's, it's a, the Pauline Kael uh, syndrome where, you know, she never met anyone who ever thought to vote for Richard Nixon for president. How, how could Nixon have won? You know, I, I didn't meet anyone 
I've never, I don't know anyone who voted for him. Well, that's what's happened in a lot of the chattering classes in Washington, D.C. If you get outside the Beltway, most people think, uh, you know, unless they are, unless they're, you know, Democrats, uh, but most people in, in the middle of the road, they, they think that the president is going to win re-election. And so, you know, I know his poll numbers aren't great. I know his uh, Twitter account is really annoying. Um, and I know that, you know, the economy is taking a hit because of COVID-19. And I, I know that people want to get COVID-19 um, um, under control. And I think that that's really important for this president. But I think that, I think one other thing, it's actually really hard to beat an incumbent. Uh, and um, and most times, if you have a growing economy, uh, you and 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 things people perceive that things are going to get better, uh, they're going to vote for the president. So I do think the economy, uh, ironically, is something that's in the president's favor. I don't think he necessarily gets blamed for what's happening with the economy because of COVID. So you know, I think I think Trump's going to win. Great. So, I mean, bottom line takeaway for folks that are listening to this webinar, it is neck and neck. It's closer. Um, it's still an interesting game. Um, let's put it that way. And, Jeremy, let's go ahead and publish the results. So just as I had suspected when we published the results of who you will be voting for, um, you get a lot of this kind of shyness of folks. And we're going to kind of touch on this a little bit, how the news impacts voters in just a second. But I think kind of you see um, a lot of people are going to be voting for Trump. Um, they might still think Biden's going to win, but at the end of the day, that's who's going to be their better candidate for their wallet, for their business, um, for the direction of this country. And um, that's, that's one of the reasons is I'm a betting woman and I do like to bet. So I, I'm going to put my money, I think, <laughs> on Trump for the election. <laughs> um, you never know. We've got a long way to go. Like, look, and we'll yeah, touch we'll, on we'll, this. We too. have a we are we have a long way to go. We've got a lot of things. We still don't know, you know, schools are going to be remain closed. We still don't know where the COVID numbers are going to be. We, just don't, we still don't know what the next catastrophe is going to be. Um, and, you know, there's always an October surprise. Every election has an October surprise. We have no, no idea what that October surprise is. It's a surprise. So, um, you know, I think you're, you're precisely right. And I think that, you know, the president is not winning right now. I don't think he's currently way ahead. I don't think the polls are that far off. They're off, but not that far off. But um, so I, I know. But I, to your point, I don't think this election's over yet, and I think there's a lot that could happen to have it go one way or the other. Absolutely. So let's kind of get back to some of the questions here. Um, that really kind of segues us in. Um, you know, Trump wins. Let's. We can say maybe Trump's going to win the presidency, but the Senate. You know, the Republicans lose the Senate. Republicans are going to lose the House. Now what? I mean, how does Trump kind of navigate not having any allies in people who are going to be writing the legislation? Is this going to be another yeah, um, impeachment inquiry on him? What's, what's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the thing that um, you have to ask yourself. Will the Democrats decide that they want to launch another impeachment uh, effort against the president, or will they try – uh, to find ways to get some solid results so they can solidify their own majority. I think that, um, you know, sometimes we have a long history in this country of having oppositional government where you have the Congress in, in, in one, one party and the president of another party. And somehow, you know, we find ways to get some things done that we have to get done and then leave a lot of other things on the table. I think the number one issue that they're going to face is how do we deal with getting a vaccine and get the schools back open and then get, get the economy moving again and help, you know, all these small businesses that have completely been destroyed because of, of the COVID. This is the, the most catastrophic thing that I've seen, um, more so than war, more so than anything. This COVID crisis has really, really changed a lot of how we do business in this, in, in this country. So, um, you know, I think that that is, um, that's going to be the thing that we have to figure out. Will the Democrats decide they want to get some solid things done, or will they decide that they want to try to find a get get away to get rid of this president? And I, you know, if you think about what happened with uh, uh, Bill Clinton uh, after he won re-election, the Republicans decided they wanted to impeach him. Uh, you know, you think about what um, the Democrats did uh, when Richard Nixon won re-election; they decided they want to impeach him. So, you know, I can't. I can't tell you that impeachment is off the table because I think that 
you know, there's so much, such a level of animosity between the president and the Democrats that uh, the most likely path is that they try to get him get him out of the office. And you know, I want to add to that, and you touched on this in your presentation, just for folks that are kind of participating in this webinar today. Imagine Trump as president; he is going to appoint the next Supreme Court justice. You know, we've got. Ginsburg, that's not going to be here a long time. You just don't know what's going to happen to people's health or when they want to throw in the towel. And think about having Mitch McConnell right now who's been able to really, like, shepherd through judges and confirming folks all over the country to have more conservative courts. And then if we look at the biggest, the highest court of them all, that's really going to be troublesome. I do want to get to another question, um, John. This is a two-parter. And I ask this question to people who I interview, people who I talk to. I'm just fascinated by the answer. And I also kind of want to talk a little bit more about what that means for folks kind of in the audience today. But where do you get your news? I mean, there's so much noise out there. We've got CNN. You've got Fox. It's like playing to these polarizations. Everybody with a Twitter account can kind of put their opinion out there. Where do you get your news? Like, where should people on this webinar be getting their political news from? Well, I, I tell you what I, I, I do is I, I try to read the uh, Washington Post and the New York Times, uh, you know, get the headlines from them as quickly as possible. I go to a website called Real Clear Politics if I, from all my political news uh, because it really does a good job of giving me uh, articles that uh, I wouldn't see otherwise. Um, and then I try to do some of my, you know, I, I spend a lot of time on social media trying to figure out, um, you know, what um, uh, – what people are posting on Twitter, what people are posting on Facebook, because I think you can learn a lot from a lot of different sources. Uh, and then I try to look at my own facts and try to figure out, okay, how do I, you know, for COVID, you know, can I go to the CDC website and figure out what the data actually tells me? Because I just, you know, I frankly, I don't trust the media anymore. I mean, I have a lot of friends in the media, but I know that they're trying to drive a narrative. And I think it's really, really important to understand that uh, they are going to give you the news that they want to give you, not the news that you that you want to see. And um, I think it's really you know it, it, you have to be an active reader and an active listener to figure out what what the where the truth actually is. And you have to understand the the, the biases of the people who are writing the news. And there's a lot of biases. And I think that what's what's happened more than anything else because of uh, the, the decline of the of local newspapers. I mean, so many local newspapers have gone completely belly up, which is, I think, one of the great tragedies uh, in, in American history. And so you really do need to kind of be more aggressive in trying to find out where, where, what's really happening in your community and what's really happening with your elected officials. And you have to also take into account, okay, what is the what are the biases of the people who are trying to feed me the news and, and can I believe what they're saying? Yeah, that's helpful. Um, let me wrap up with one more question. I feel like there's so much hate in politics, so polarized today. Um, people really can't even say what they think without somebody kind of jumping on top of them, um, or you kind of get these echo chambers of people that are thinking the same thing you're thinking and reinforcing those thoughts with you. And, you know, that really gives us an interesting environment. So I think for everybody that's on here, um, you know, you feel so helpless. Like, what can I do? Um, how can I engage uh, with other people that might have a different opinion, um, but mainly how can I make a difference? Um, and so, John, what do you recommend? Is it supporting your local pol politicians? Like, what is the thing in our daily lives that we can do aside from participating in MCMA's grassroots efforts? What, what are things that folks at home can be doing to engage in this process, shape this process, making sure that their values or at least being heard and someone's representing them. Yeah, yeah. what I always like to say is that politics is a participation sport. Uh, you need to really, and everyone, you know, you can get a trophy if you participate. And by trophy, you get it to your views heard, and you uh, have the opportunity to really make an impact. I, 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 when I moved to Washington 30 years ago, I didn't know anybody, and nobody knew me. And I volunteered. I, I took an internship. And I, I got myself engaged in and got a job uh, and really didn't know anything. But I, you know, five years later, I was writing speeches for the House Minority Leader and it, speeches that had that actually had an impact on history. So it, it doesn't take that long to have an impact if you have the wherewithal to do it. And to your point, there's plenty of ways to, 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 to engage. And that is, you know, whether you volunteer on a campaign or write your letters to your local official or, you know, 
aggressively, not aggressively, but you know, respectfully reach out to staff um, or, or give political contributions through your PAC. Um, you know, there's just those, so many different ways to, to, to get engaged with the political process. And the fact is that any politician worth, the, worth his salt is going to want to know what his constituents, his or her salt, uh, is going to want to know, you know, what the local constituents, you know, want and what they, what they, what, what they, what they care about. And so, you know, I think the most important thing, though, is to try to do it respectfully. If you, if you, if you do it out of anger, if you do it in a way that is, you know, counterproductive, you're not going to, you're not going to help yourself. And the other thing I would say is you don't have to make everything about politics. I mean, politics is one part of your life, you know, and, you know, you don't necessarily have to be one of those guys uh, or, or who gets involved in endless debates on Facebook about the local political thing. I mean, I think in many ways, you know, policy is, is very important. If it's something of, uh, that affects you personally, it's something very, very important. But, you know, endlessly opining on politics at the dinner table is something that not necessarily is the best idea. So advice again. Well, it seems like folks here are already going to be engaged. Um, you're using your trade association. They can set up those meetings for you. And uh, rumor has it that you're engaging a member of Congress for a political action committee event following this session. Is that right, Byers? That is correct, Rachel. Great segue into all of this. Um, yeah, we've got a great uh, PAC reception coming up uh, uh, with our interactions with our representative uh, Brett Guthrie. Uh, who was one of our, our primary sponsor for our checkout program. So, uh, and, and some of the things that you were talking about, John, the engagement, the grassroots efforts by this organization that, that really pushed uh, the legislation across the line. So, man, what a great, great hour we've had here. I wish we could go longer. Um, this has been fantastic dialogue between the two of you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, and, and bringing us all together, giving your viewpoints and, and whatnot. This session will be posted to the NCMA website, so if you have a question for Rachel or John, their contact information will be on there uh, within a day or so or whenever uh, Bob gets all that stuff going. And i got to get to the last slide here. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, we're getting ready to head to the PAC reception. Um, so you're all welcome to join. Uh, thank you so much. You get a chance. There's a lot of big winnings, a lot of great stuff. So followed by a, a beer tour because we're in Milwaukee, remember. So um, yeah, with that, I, I have to wrap up because I have to run. Um, Rachel, thank you so much. It was great seeing you virtually again. John, it was wonderful meeting you virtually here. Enjoy your time thank at you. Kiowa. Um, and we will see everybody in about 10 minutes at the PAC reception. So thank awesome. you so much. Thank Bye, y'all. Thank Bye. you. Anybody there?